Looks like everyone is back. Um, okay, before we move forward, let me just uh, another word of encouragement. It's from Laundry, and it's it's a it's it's a quote from from uh, the Bible. Um, Let not your heart be troubled. Be troubled. So um, that's you know we ended. We started with word of encouragement. You know before you went into your breakout room. So, hey, what's wrong with starting with another word of encouragement? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Laundry. Um, I'll definitely, I, right now, I'm not allowing myself to be troubled, you know, after listening to people. So that's that adds to the encouragement. Um, I imagine you had good conversations. And um, let's move forward with uh, in no particular order. Let's start with group five this time. Um, if you want to tell us what your question was and if um, you want to speak, if you have a spokesperson or you want to speak as a team, that's fine. But let's start with group five. And what I mean by that, I, I believe you organize the groups are, uh, according to the questions, uh, Mujahidi, that's what I'm thinking. Oh. Okay, and, and I think she's also posted the question. So go ahead, group five. I wouldn't want to start this since I joined Kenale. Um I remember Zama Remy. Right? Were we, were we group, we're group five or group, five, or group yeah, two? We're, we're group five, I believe. Uh, group five. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, like I, I literally can't leave this. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I will. I will okay. try. So, our question was: Has the Ubuntu message of communal cooperation and harmony been weakened by patriarchal societies that empower men and marginalize women? And if I recall, we some of the points that were shared say that it was true that it has been like that, that Ubuntu, but it was more positive that patriarchy in society is being, no, it's, Okay, maybe <laughs> patriarchy in society is separating men and women, so like putting people against each other and things like that. But with the move to message, there is hope that it's just highlighting uh, those inequalities. So like for women, Ubuntu, for instance, women being able to speak up because you're in the society, you're part of the society, and you speak up for yourself and say what is going on with the issue in society. And for men, it's mostly to hold them accountable to their behavior and their uh, how they treat women, for instance, in this case. So we talked about that and it was, it come to a consensus that, yeah, definitely that society is the way, the way patriarchy is acting in society kind of normally tend to reduce that cooperation between genders and between different groups of the society. And then we branched out of it and when they talked about uh, Me Too movement and men are trash and other topics related to the same, related to patriarchy in society and things like that. So that's, I don't know if anyone want to add more or, yeah. And let me, let me just say there's nothing wrong with, with branching out because eventually, you know, these questions, they're, they're interconnected. So some of the things you've talked about, you know, you may refer to them, uh, whatever you talked about regarding say the uh, Me Too movement, that may come up again and you may um, engage in that conversation. Um, so that, that's fine, um, the branching out that you talk about. Anybody else um, from group five, anybody want to add? And just maybe going back to the conversation we had with regards to um, men are trash, uh, we spoke about why was there an opposing movement, which was called all, Not All Men. And then I asked people in my group, we asked each other, um, it's the same as saying that um, 
all white people are racist simply because they benefit from a system that supports them. So the whole point of having men are trash movement is to say that um, males benefit from a patriarchal system. Therefore, um, having a conversation about not all men dilutes the whole intention behind the movement. Uh, so that's what we spoke about. Thank you. And I do appreciate it. one of the things I'm hearing here uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, Remy referred more directly to the word accountability. I think in all of this one, there's something that's important. And, and in my introduction, I tried to uh, uh, present that. And that's the fact that at some point I need to look at myself and, and hold myself accountable. Um, because I think that's the process, part, part of the process of it eventually creating the kind of harmony that, that you know, uh, we're talking about here. Uh, anybody else from group five? If not, I'm going to move to a different group. Uh, another thing to just add on that is, um, we said uh, the, the whole patriarchal system in society, it, it hasn't really weakened the um, cooperation between people, it has made us unite and like recognize the inequalities that are there. So, and also with the help of, uh, as Remy said, like if we have people who have voices that have more power and they can be heard, all of those are tools which we can use to uh, organize ourselves and uh, get back to uh, correcting injustice. Absolutely, so like we already indicated earlier, it may, uh, whatever the problem is, there's room to build on that and actually get something good out of the, the whatever the problem is and, and that we move forward in society. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's go to uh, group two. And uh, I think the question looks longer than it really is, but we can still post it. Um, and uh, so if you're in group two and you want to start to share with us uh, some of the points you made or some of the ideas you shared, uh, we are listening. Oh, okay. Um, good morning and afternoon to everyone. Um, I think our question was based on the, from the articles that was posted um, of the GPV and um, the question was for a country that went through a long history of liberation struggles, which involved demand for inclusive justice and safety. Why are many of its girls and women still the victims of the GBV? So we, we, we actually discussed a lot and then I'm sure my colleagues, we will also add on this. Uh, the final point, um, that came out out of, of, out, out of our, our dialogue was the, the main reason for GBV is the uh, patriarchism. So that means um, we learn it from home. So it's moving from generation to generation because it's a long being this thing of patriarchism and the gender-based violence. So, but if you look in the past 10 years or 25 years, as you go back, it, it worsens as, as, as the time progresses because the GBV now it's, it turns out to, to killing of uh, women and, 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 and children. So the main reason for that, we, we actually say it's it, it because of the patriarchism. And maybe to add on that, uh, another study actually pointed out that the main reason of GBV is the high, uh, high unemployment rate in, in South Africa because most of the men in South Africa are stressed and then they take out the stress to women. So I didn't add that during our dialogue. But um, I think two weeks back, I had the chat with the, one of the directors of the other foundations where we discussed that. So it, it came out that the unemployment rate is in correlation with the, with the GPV. So it's, it's the unemployment rate and the patriarchism because it's more from generation to generation and, and it becomes worse each year. And maybe maybe must call our justice or culture and we'll add on this. Thank you. So, you know, apart from the, 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 the whatever sexist problems may exist, they're aggravated by other social and perhaps 
economic problems. Anyone else from group two? Um, we started talking about uh, Brock Turner at one point in just that case and um, how it's, it's not the only one, it's not unique. There are plenty of, of middle class or high class white men who get away with these kind of crimes, um, you know, of, of raping women um, and getting like two or three months in jail or like some, some really minor type of, you know, uh, I guess I'm losing the word for it, but, you know, not really getting any, any consequences for that. And then I also kind of talked about like college, college culture and um, how that plays into gender-based violence. Like, for example, as a girl, I refuse to go to parties alone. Uh, Javon knows this, we're, we're roommates and best friends. I do not go to parties by myself. And really what I mean by by myself is I don't go without um, a man in my group or several men in my group because going on your own, it's, it's too often that women go on their own and something happens um, because of a man at the party or, for example, there's a lot of parties at MSU where they just don't let men in, period. And um, I don't want to end up at a party like that. So I always make sure I have men in my group. Um, and I was also kind of talking about how it's weird that there's like a power dynamic of like women not really being seen as equal. So women are kind of in this position where they have to keep men close to them or keep men in their circles just to kind of get by uh, safely. And um, yeah, so I, that, was, that was my perspective on that. All right, thank you so much. Justice, um, anyone else from group two? Yeah, so um, I think as a general consensus, we kind of agreed that there are multiple things that contribute to why women are still victims or like survivors rather to gender-based violence. Um, but I think um, a lot of it does have to do with um, like how there is that different power dynamic, especially in like law and policy. So um, we talked about like how reproductive rights in women and how their bodies are always being policed and being like, they're always dictated what they should do with their body instead of us like protecting their body against violence. So, um, the power dynamic in like men just deciding what women should do with their body like perpetuates that violence even more. Thank you so much, good point. Yeah, anybody else from uh, group two? Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I just thought it was quite interesting in terms of looking at um, GBV in South Africa and more in America, GBV, but through the lens of um, discrimination in terms of like the genders and patriarchy in society. Um, and I think something that Justice kind of brought up is like even when you, uh, when institutions like our universities put together in our case would be maybe anti-racism campaigns or anti-racism um, uh, trainings um, or um, sexual sensitivity or GBV sensitivity trainings. But real people that you're targeting tend to find ways to not to go to those sessions um, as well. So it was kind of interesting just to kind of observe that um, and just think about it in our um, own context uh, over here uh, as well. And then the other thing that was very kind of prevalent is that um, in terms of like discussing whether GBV has accelerated throughout the years or it's just that we're noticing it more now because we're having conversations and the intergenerational um, kind of inheritance of GBV, it just seems to be just been going on from one generation to the next in just different forms and some of the forms just being more uh, aggravated. Um, and I think what our closing sentiments were was that perhaps this generation in terms of like um, challenging um, overtly gender roles and patriarchy um, may begin to kind of and questions around notions of femininity and masculinity 
we might be starting to maybe have a broader conversation which might start chipping away at the core philosophy of this dominance of toxic masculinity that performs GDV in overwhelmingly disparate numbers compared to like females. Thank you so much. I, I do want to well, say that. Um, I was gonna say, I'm yeah, just, go ahead. since I was a little late, um, on women, and it comes to social fabric, like if you, it's really interesting, if you view women as bottlenecks because women are effectively the key to a lot of societal development. Um, without them, your population is capped. I'm sure you've heard these theories, but even in day-to-day -day patriarchy, like you have things like, like bars and clubs, I believe Justice was touching on this briefly. Um, women are the sole advertising attractment for like a lot of bars, a lot of clubs, because without them, you're not gonna get men, people with the buying power who go. So in a lot of cases, women are treated like, like bottom lines, points and capitals, bottlenecks that allow kind of, um, that, that attract people with capital, i.e. men. And it's kind of crazy that if you do stop this kind of system, you undercut a lot. Um, so I think, when moving past patriarchal points like this, it's going to be really difficult because you really, are you really, how are you gonna be able to convince something that has a, a base in capital? And a lot of systems, if you, if we spent the time to really go at it, and I've been late, so I don't have the time to talk about that, but um, if you really look at it, a lot of systems treat women as capital points and means to derive capital out of something because they are the main attractors to the, and even I'm guilty. If there's not, like, if it's just all dudes there, I have a lot of guy friends. Why would I go out and pay for that? Like, I'm going there to meet women or like socialize. The one underlying point for a lot, a lot of men is the fact of whether girls were there or not. And that's that's just my point. It's economics. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. How do you, you know, do away with something that, like you say, is based in capital, just like a lot of other vices, whether it's racism or anything else. I do want to say that even though this article focuses on South Africa, if you look at the bottom part of that question, you know, I do indicate that this is really not just about South Africa because a lot of societies that have gone through periods of struggle, it is so ironic that after going through so much struggle where the focus is on human rights and the dig dignity of people and justice and safety, then you have things like this happening. It is, it is, it is, it is ironic in a bad way. Um, also, I do want to apologize because this, this article, there were some references there that are quite gory and I should have mentioned, you know, called attention to the fact that it would, it could probably trigger certain emotions. So I'm, I apologize that um, I didn't say that. Um, we may come back to some of these things. Um, let, let's just go to another group. And, and if you still have something to say from uh, uh, um, group two, you, you'll still say it, but let's just hear something slightly different. Let's go to group three. And um, after group three, we, the, I'll ask uh, Direko to you know, help us out if there's anything in the chats that she would like to share and then we'll go on to the last i think one or two questions so group three uh our question uh, in some african countries individuals have begun to uh, define themselves as gay transgender and transsexual and are facing various forms of assault discrimination uh, while addressing issues of gender equality should african countries also be doing more or taking uh taking a different action to address issues of sexual identity um so the uh, the conversation um, sort of, uh, uh, it was a tough question because um, uh, the, 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 the identities in question, um, it, no one, no one ex ex explicitly expressed identifying as. Um, and so, uh, so it was, um, so it, it, it veered into the theoretical. Uh, uh, and so um, questions of uh, how do we respect culture um, uh, because um, some identities, uh, uh, one point that was brought up was that some of these identities are um, are limited by culture, and and is it is it is it unfair that culture has a has um, has a right to sort of uh, um, rein in or limit some of these um, 
limit some of these identities uh, and with the state uh, also playing a role to ensure that uh, all bodies have uh, autonomy and all gender identities have expression. Uh, and there were uh, some, some back and forth, some back and forth about, uh, about that. And there isn't a clear answer on how you, how you balance that. Um, culture uh, uh, does uh, seem to have a way of um, finding its own way of expressing, uh, expressing different gender identities. So uh, let's say um, talked about mining culture, maybe she would want to uh, express, it, ex uh, express it again, but um, mining culture in which um, uh, men, men had partnered, were partnered with other men and it was, um, and it was a form of a, 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 an expression of gender identity. It just didn't fall under the kind of labeling um, that Western frameworks, Western language has. Um, maybe let's say go or somebody else want to take it from there. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can, I can take it from there. Um, so uh, I also spoke about uh, kind of like my summer internship and I'm from Uganda and it was in Uganda last year where I worked with some trans groups or people identified as those groups and it, it's healthcare, right? So it was around HIV, but they mentioned how there's so much sexual assault um, for them and the sexual assault is to spite them. It's to say, you identify as gay or lesbian, I'm gonna show you that you're not, right? You identify as a transgender male or transgender female, I'm gonna show you that you're not, right? If you like this and you're not. So it was very disturbing to hear their stories. Um, and that I think roots from culture. And we also talked about how it roots from religion, um, unfortunately. And the fact that there's a fixed mindset around the thing. And then in terms of the discrimination piece, when they go to healthcare uh, institutions to try and get like maybe HIV tests or just condoms or anything they need, they're discriminated against. They're like, well, someone like you, what were you doing to get you know, HIV or whatever? You deserve it, that kind of thing. So in terms of what African countries can do more, it's very difficult because it's very complex. We have religion, we have culture, there's so much that Les Segal talked about, but I think, you know, we, I think we should take the next best step at least, or a step in the right direction. And that would be in this case to start with human rights, you know, if their basic needs, if their basic needs of safety, healthcare, all this stuff can be, can be normalized, you know, like every single person deserves a right to healthcare, to safety, to not be um, stoned down to death, like it happens in Uganda and Kenya, just because of what you identify as, then the rest of the conversations can begin to happen. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, I, I think the fact that there's any kind of conversation is, 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 is encouraging because in some places it's still a no-go area and the, the violence is just appalling. In uh, certain cases, like in Nigeria, you know, if you're gay, you go to jail for like 12, 13 years. How do you identify people that are gay in a, in, in a society where you have some of the most closet gay people? Um, I, it, none of that makes sense to me, but anyway, um, let's share uh, maybe one or two more points from um, group three. If not, we can come to, back to the topic. Let me just say something. I, I thought it was interesting when Kravinel was talking about culture and I'm not sure how you are situating it, but it's interesting that because there's a book recently written by a professor from Nigeria, a history professor, uh, I almost called her father's name, Wando Achebe, I almost said Chinwa Achebe. But, um, and it's interesting how she defines transgender and transsexual in, in African society. She says, the problem is that we look at it purely from Western societies, but she talked about gods that were, uh, that didn't have any, uh, and, and, and that were not identified by gender. She talked about gods that had both that were identified as both genders. She talked about female priests and male priestesses, stuff. It was just so interesting. I, I can't go into it in detail, but I think you get a sense of what I'm talking about. And she, she kind of aligned what she looked at uh, from this spiritual perspective. She merged that with what happens in society and said, this is not really unusual. It's just that the way it is defined and stated and approached in Western society is not the way we've done it, but it's been there. And unfortunately, because we're embracing the, the Western angle, 
we're becoming hostile to a culture, long-standing cultures that we've had. It's interesting, um, but anyway, that's my summary of that. It's, 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 uh, I'll probably share the title of that book later on. And if you're interested in that kind of history, it's really around women, but it gets into sexuality. I'll, I'll share the title and you know, if, if you're interested in getting a copy, that's fine. Um, let's look, let's go to um, question one or group one, excuse me. And this one touches more directly on the Me Too movement, but yes, anyone from that group? Philip, do you mind if we maybe go through the... Oh yeah, I actually said I would do that. So go ahead, we'll do that. And then we'll come back to uh, group one and we'll end up with group four. So please go ahead, uh, Diego. Okay, so I, I won't read all of the chats, uh, but what I will do is there was an interesting, com there's an interesting conversation that's happening and I think you can all sort of see it unfold, but I'm gonna read what was introduced earlier on, on I think the themes around, um, what is it, accountability and responsibility when it comes to patriarchy, you know, whose role is it to sort of help? Okay, so I'm gonna start, the circle started here, she said, Mm, what we also need and are not making a part of the conversation is that male accountability is overemphasized and seldom do we speak about accountability on the same empowered people. I think we also need to recognize agency as such as we as much as we recognize empowerment. Maybe this is too much, but it's just an investigated assertion. The very same people that speak publicly against the patriarchal condition are the very same ones that in closed doors uphold some elements of this institute. Um, and then I think Kwabena came in and he said, no one escapes patriarchy. That does create very complicated problems with how to dismantle it. And I believe Javon and a few others were sort of saying they agree on that. And then another perspective came in uh, from Hela. And she said, when discussing the patriarchy, I think it is incredibly important to acknowledge that the patriarchy as an institution and a system that boxes in both men and women. Oh, sorry, I think I may have misread that, but it boxes in both men and women. Normally this harms women and is an advantage to men, but dismantling the patriarchy is not to dismantle men. It is to educate and establish how they can remove themselves from patriarchal systems attitudes and roles. And thereafter, I think everyone is sort of, you know, chiming in and um, contributing to that conversation. I won't read all of it, it's really quite long. So yeah. I think those, those <laughs> I just, things, Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I just wanna, I just wanna respond because um, I, think, I think this is actually pretty important. Um, so uh, uh, directly to Javon, I'm, 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 I'm not being resistant. Um, I've seen all kinds of violence. Like I, I and I've I seen that. I, I believe you too. I've seen that <laughs> I'm out by, both, by both men and women against men and women, right? So that's so that's that's one, right? Like, um, and violence is constitutive of the world that I grew up in. Everyone experienced and 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 sort of traded in violence. You need it to survive. Miami, um, where are you from? I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Saginaw. We were I grew up right. like a couple of blocks from where the falls. From where Biggie Smalls live, like I like, you know, Bed Stuy is one here, Crown Heights, and then Flatbush. I grew up right on the edge of Flatbush and Crown Heights. So, um, so, so when I say that, like, we have to talk about the ways in which um, uh, patriarchy is uh, is it, it like, it, you know, it's sort of sewn into the lives of both men and women. Um, I, I I I mean that that it, like it takes on. It takes on the the kinds of thinking and the and the kinds of actions that that um, that are endemic of patriarchy. Both men and women engage in. Um, also, uh, uh, I brought this up in group. Uh, I'll bring it up here again. It seems to me that like when we talk about patriarchy, there seems to be a conflation with men. And so the the um, the uh, the person that said that like um, when we talk about patri you know, we need to like teach men about separating separating themselves from patriarchy. I totally agree that's true, 
But if patriarchy is a system and a way of thinking and a set of institutions, we shouldn't be talking about individual men or even men as a class. So I think those need to be decoupled. I mean, that's one thing. And I'll say that I'll say the other controversial. Um, I, I say the other controversial thing, right? When we talk about gender-based violence and violence against women, those two need to seem to be coupled together. And there's violence against boys. There's a, yeah. um, a um, and, and, boys. and and violence against men too. And so my 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 thing is not to like what I don't want to do is to is to deny the importance and the and the 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 work of like gender-based violence and violence against women. That is real. That's stuff that I've seen, I've like seen with my own eyes. So like I'm I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that if 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 the institutions of patriarchy are held up, not directly by men, but by systems and ways of thinking, and that women also are are, are subject to those to those systems, then you know how we approach it shouldn't be just simply a question about men, but it should be a question about institutions and systems. Yes, men are implicated. Yes, men have to do more work. I'm not saying that. I'm not denying that. But I think the way the narrative goes is that it's like, it's simply, we just need to fix men as opposed to fixing patriarchy. And I think that th there's a, you know, there's some stuff that we need to, I think there's some stuff that needs to be decoupled. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and you know, which is why I think what Natalie said is important because when, when she starts talking about transgender, uh, gays and the rest of them, it's not really about gender anymore. It's really about institutional uh, systems of, of, of prejudice and violence, but, but well taken. Thank you so much. Um, let's, let's hear from group one and we may have the time to come back to some of this stuff, but I would like us to at least hear from the, the two groups we've not heard from. So group one. Yeah, um, I was a part of group one and I guess to start, like I think that this uh, speaks to where our conversation ended, but I'll begin there now to briefly address the comments that were just made. Um, when I hear it said that um, it's a system that, back, that that harms both men and women, when I said that it boxes in both men and women, that was the entirety of my point. Everything that I heard you say, I felt was exactly the, what I was trying to say. And I, like I said, I apologize for not for not stating it in a way that was digestible or understandable within the context of the experiences that you've had, but what, but I I do believe that the the normative narrative that we are we are fed and told is that it is um, a problem with men. And my entire point was that it isn't a problem with men; it's a problem with patriarchy. Patriarchy is an institutionalized systemic problem that that is harmful to all all members involved in that. But there is also the truth that between the female and male perspective, the male hand is is a greater holder of that of that patriarchal systems they they are and when I say educate, I don't mean tell them what they're doing wrong. I mean, empower them to understand that they don't have to be a part of those patriarchal systems, that the ways that they have been boxed in and taught to behave and act and take on violence and own violence in a certain way within their very being is not something that they that they have to do, that there are other ways that we can coexist in a society together that isn't based inherently in, in violence and in gender. Uh, and so I, I have no, no right or foot to stand on to speak to your, to your direct experience but I do apologize if any of my comments were derogatory to the things that you've experienced that brought you to the points that you hold. I find that they're incredibly valid. Um, and as, as a victim of sexual assault by a male person in power, I am entirely and inherently and intimately aware of the ways in which the male dynamic of power advantaged that person against me. And so I do believe that as someone who has been harmed by that system, I am immediately less position to do something about it. As much as I wish I had the same rights and power to dismantle the patriarchy as my male counterparts do, I don't. As a black woman in America, I don't have the same power. I don't have the same platform. And so I am asking those that do have a greater, a greater stake in those systems to own that and to do something about it. And I think that's something that we all have to be able to create spaces and conversations and ways to do together because it does take all of us but some of us are just positioned currently in this moment to do more. Um, and I think that speaks entirely to the conversation that, that we had in, in my group and how uh, the Me Too movement to speak directly to our question um, was, only, was only a tiny little scratch on that surface. I think it made it seem like coming out and claiming that you were a victim was enough to get a rallying cry behind you and uh, for victims of this sort of violence that have happened in a multitude of ways, including 
male victims of of this of this system it didn't account for the, their experiences and it didn't account for the long struggle that it takes to to move on from those times it made it and it made it an instant it made you your entirety was the fact that you were raped or you were assaulted rather than the fact that that is a traumatic experience that is then distilled into your DNA. It is something that that trauma is something that you pass on to, to for generations to come. And it Me Too doesn't account for that, for that longer history. Um, so yeah, we talked a lot about why it's called gender-based violence in the first place and, and who is responsible for creating these, these systems and these structures um, and why it's, it's, uh, digressed into these this thank you so, yeah thank you so much i'm glad this is being recorded so because it's just so much to digest but i do appreciate it um thank you uh Hela. um anyone else group one okay we, we can still come back to some of this stuff say, and, like, uh, yeah uh, go ahead uh, i gotta admit these are some great points like in most circles i can't get this without people like being in their bag about it, like, like in the bag is kind of, you know what I mean? Like in their own little box, but like, oh my God, you know, uh, it's, it's, I appreciate all the pleasant discourse guys. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I also want to say, I think it's important when we discuss some of these issues to remember that they also play out slightly differently from society to society. You know, and even though, you know, as, as a boy at some point, um, uh, I, I, I did experience, uh, I was violated, so to speak, and it's not something I would say some years ago, but I've, I've, I've moved past it, you know, I'm much older than I was when I was that young. But even then, I still think, um, compared to girls and women in the country I grew up in, in Nigeria, I'm, you know, still much less vulnerable than they are. So I think from society to society, this plays out um, differently. But in the end, it's really about a communal experience. So whether it's a boy or whether it's anyone of any kind of sexual identity or gender, you know, nobody should be experiencing some of the types of violence that we've talked about. Um, let's hear from um, group four. And uh, what happened last week was some of us who could stayed on. So if you want to do that, that's fine. Although we officially end in about um, 12 minutes. So please go ahead, group four. Um, yeah, I'll start off because I have to go soon. Um, so our question was about, um, are there certain cultures or customs that um, can be blamed for gender-based violence? And we started off talking about how men are praised a lot um, in society. And Mimi talked about how when her older brother was born, um, they had like, in her culture, they had a celebration like all week when males are born. And I don't think the same is done for when females are born. And then um, I brought up the point that um, in the home, women are like expected to serve and do everything for the man and they kind of just sit around often. And because of that, they start to like build this like authority or authoritative like mentality. And um, that mentality like leaves the home and goes out into the world as they leave. And sometimes it can be imposed on strangers as well. Like you feel like you have authority over a woman that you probably just met and you think you can do whatever that you want with them. And so it kind of, it starts in the home and then it starts to fester into society as you move into the world. And um, um, I think we also brought up the point of how um, our approach needs to be very different in how we address these issues. Laundry talked about how um, we have to create more multi-dimensional um, multi approaches and how we talk about these issues in order to combat that as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. And to add to what Mavis is saying, um, so just um, like, uh, like she mentioned, my, when my brother was my dad's first child, there was a whole week of celebration, <laughs> a whole entire week, every day party. When I was born, 
he wasn't even at the hospital. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, that is just a, a like, as Mavis is saying, it's not really saying, oh, because men are, are, are there's more gratification showing to when a male child is born. Um, that means they're, they're, you know, they're allowed to do, you know, whatever, but it, it's more so that one thing that we stressed in our group a lot was it's, it's, it's depending on the individual and the, the individual is the one that makes the choice, you know, of course, at the end of the day. Um, but um, one thing, another thing that um, I had a story to tell, and I don't know if you guys mind me sharing, I'm going to try to be quick. Um, so I have um, some cousins um, um, who watched their mother get beaten by their father. And um, that unfortunately created a sort of hatred in their heart. And I, me mental health is not something Africans, you know, really think or parents really think or talk about much. So I, I take it upon myself to reach out to them and ask them um, questions and see where, you know, where their, their, their mind, what, what is done to them mentally. Um, and, and also trying to make sure that they don't carry, and we talked about unforgiveness in our um, group. And um, one thing I asked them was, what is, what is it harder for you to do, forgive or forget? Just to see where, you know, they would like kind of stem towards. And they said it's harder for them to forgive. Um, usually I feel like when I ask this question to people, they say forget, um, but yes, for them it's forgive. And, and of course the reason they gave why is because of their father and the things that he did. They, they can never forgive him for that. And I don't, I never, I can't re relate to them personally, and um, but I, I try to encourage them to forgive because of our religion. And um, Laundry uh, said something, and I, don't, I, I think it's best if it comes from her at this point. She, uh, she added something to my comment about unforgiveness um, and, and, and not allowing just, you, you can forgive someone, but still not allow them to do the things that they do, basically, is what she kind of said. Um, but yeah, and so I feel that the, the Sierra Leonean men in, in, in general, a, a lot of uncles and even my dad, they're kind of like, their mentality is kind of like, well, my wife did this and I can't accept this. You know, I can't accept this is my household. We don't do this in our house, no and they take it upon themselves to handle the matter and and they do it in any which way possible they think they they think that they can because they feel like they have that power and i feel like that comes from childhood that comes from the the way in which women are not are are, are treated by even our parents sometimes we're kind of just like if you have some traditional parents you you will understand what i mean by this kind of they 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 they, they have us focusing on certain things and only this thing and they don't really try to encourage us to be leaders be you know stick up for yourself and, and things like that it's kind of like be submissive to your husband like and and that's something that i feel needs to change um but yeah that's my story thank you so much uh Mame. and i do appreciate you know talking and, and citing personal experience I know that's not always easy, but I do appreciate that. We do appreciate that. Uh, Durego, uh, any, maybe one or two comments from, from chat before we, uh, because we're getting to the end here, we're getting close to 10.30. Sure, I mean, it got really, really nice towards the end. I think um, I was almost gonna read everything, but if you said one or two, I now I have to really make a choice. So I'm gonna start off with maybe some of the earlier comments that may have not made their way into the conversation. Um, well, they did, but let me expand on it a little bit. Where to start? Okay, so Kaylin um, says this, I think patriarchy influences everyone. Um, again, these are conversations, so I'm, I'm so sorry if I, I feel like I'm intrusive sometimes when I'm reading them. <laughs> At Masikale, I don't think patriarchy affects everyone equally, but I do think it affects us all. For example, gendered norms push the narrative of men being the provider and not emotional beings, which I think leaves men at a disadvantage as they are unable to express themselves and in turn deal with their trauma. Another thing in South Africa, male on male violence is extremely high and not discussed much because perhaps 
it's mostly fueled by toxic masculinity and just their violent environment. I'm not gonna read, but there was a question around what toxic masculinity is and so on and so forth. But there was an interesting question that came as well from Mujadi around cultural, hold on, let me find it. I just wanna like give a little bit um, diverse responses here. Oh, okay. She said, are there customs and cultural practices in some African societies that can at least be partly blamed for gender-based violence? I thought that was an interesting question to bring into the mix. And then, okay, one last comment. Mm, okay, this is one from the most recent one. I do think there are layers of gender-based violence that I simply don't have to think about specifically for the reason that I am a man. Walking home at night with the fear of being raped um, or sexually assaulted, harassed, for instance, it's not to say that this cannot happen to men. However, the prevalence of such is so low that I am privileged as a man to have never thought about it. I'm gonna end it there, so they keep coming. <laughs> it's just so much. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it, like I said earlier, it's, it's so much to digest, but there's, on, on this topic, you know, I always learn something new. And that, for me, that's the most important thing. As long as I'm enriched by it, and there's room to explore more from what people have said in the chat. And generally, for me, that, that, that's where this is important. In addition to the fact, like I said earlier, Ron, that this forces me to look at myself. I think that self-reflection, because I've grown up around and I've been around and I'm still around women and, and daughters. So, you know, it's, um, it's important for me to continue to examine myself and, you know, uh, as rather than constantly look for some external cause of the problem or some external effect to look at myself and, and, and ask myself, how am I either uh, 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 enabling or, or, or resisting some of this stuff? Um, we have like two minutes. Um, and like I said earlier, if people want to stay on, that's fine. Um, Upenyo, I don't know if this is a good time. You just want to say really quickly about um, what happens after the last session. Sure, thank you so much. Um, just a quick uh, note here. We have this dialogue scheduled for four sessions and today was session number three. So next week is our final session. Uh, but we also just uh, thought as we were planning that these dialogues were going to be very, very robust and that you guys were going to be not very happy if we limit them to three or four. So we created an extra session, which is number five, and it's scheduled for November 5. That is not going to be like a required session. It's going to be optional. So if we conclude next week and you feel like you want an additional space to continue the conversations there is this optional session scheduled for november 5 and it's open it's going to be there and um, the facilitators and some of us will be there if you need us to be but it's a space that we created to make sure that we have room for anyone who needs it beyond that we are hoping that you guys can connect among yourselves take the initiative to link up and continue these conversations beyond the structures that were already put in place. This is your story. These are your conversations. And you are the leaders we are hoping can take over the mantle and take us into the future. So we want you to take the initiative to continue the conversations, whichever way you want, whether it's connecting over WhatsApp, whether it's something else, we would like to make sure that that happens. Finally, Nicole is helping us with uh, setting up a platform where we can also continue chatting throughout the week so that we are not limited to meeting once a week. And uh, there's a little bit of some glitches, but we are working through those and we'll let you know once that platform is available for us to come to connect. Uh, All right. Mojadi, did you wanna say one quick thing about the post dialogue surveys? Oh yeah, um, so we're going to be sending out a survey it's really just to kind of get your thoughts on all of the, the dialogue sessions that we've had um, and just like honest feedback because we're trying to kind of improve on the next ones as well. So we'll be sending that out probably either tomorrow or Monday. 
All right, thank you so much. And you know, just to add to what uh, Upenyu said, I, I, there are probably some things that you're thinking, oh, we never really got through well enough. You can start thinking about those for the extra session that he talked about. You can write them down. You can email them uh, to the group. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of things. Like I remember last session, we didn't really go into reparations and it was you know, supposed to be part of the conversation or the, or the article on roads must fall, that kind of thing. So I have things in my head and if you do, please be prepared to uh, share them and bring them up, not just for the last session, but if we can create this, uh, uh, this group chat thing that uh, Mojari just talked about, we can also continue to have the conversations throughout the week. Otherwise, um, I don't want to keep you. Thank you so much. Um, I do appreciate your comments and your ideas. Uh, like I said, I've learned a, a lot and I hope you have too. Um, I'm hoping that I'll become a better person after, after all of this. And if that happens, this would have worked for me. And you know, I, I wish and hope the same for the rest of you. Otherwise, um, yeah, if you want to stay on, um, please do. Uh, otherwise, I, I do want to formally end this session here and uh, tell you that, you know, it, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much I appreciate this. Um, Zoom sessions are not always this exciting and energizing and engaging. So I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. And I look forward to having more conversations with you throughout the week ne and next week um, as well, and perhaps in the future. All right, thank you so much and have a good um, evening. If you're in, in, in South Africa and for those of you in the US, have a good rest of the day. <laughs>